So these are just some guidelines I found. Okay, and we covered most of it, except that things I didn't cover were warm up. So start with slower music stuff. Don't jump into something really suddenly that's very really fast and challenging. Okay, try to make sure your practice area is a place you can kind of open up and spread out and not feel all cramped. Constantly remember posture. If you tend to practice for extremely long periods of time, break it up. This recommendation suggested 25 minutes of practice. Take a five minute break. Another 25, another five minutes of break. And do that like 10 times in a row. I'm kidding. However long you practice. Okay? I know Ms. Heather would want you to practice a long time. Okay? If you take a break for whatever reason, you go to vacation and you, you take a week or two off, don't go back and doing your three, minute, three, three hours of practice straight anymore. Work your way back into it. And that's true when you assume new music as well. Okay, if you're something particularly challenging and you kind of get away from it, work your way back into things, okay? Uh, if need be, you can uh, uh, use uh, the mental training to sort of fill in the gaps. And then uh, last but not least, listen if it hurts, okay? Take a break, okay? And if you take a break of an hour and a half and you come back and it still hurts, take a longer break, do some stretches. To gain flexibility, it's important to stretch after you're warmed up. Okay? The old notion was you stretch to warm up. But new research shows that, in fact, for elite athletes, of which I'm not one, okay, <laughs> but you actually lose explosive power. So most elite athletes, you'll see, don't stretch to warm up anymore. They do gentle versions of whatever sport they're going to participate in. Okay? To gain flexibility, it's been a long time known that you do stretching after you've warmed up or after practice. Okay? Next slide, please. Uh, oh, I covered some of these things. The last thing is do not bounce. A friend of mine went to a dance medicine uh, seminar once and had all these elite young dancers there. And the janitor, who had been the custodian at this building for decades, said, you want to know who the dancers are that are going to make it big and who the dancers are that are going to fail? And the doctor, my friend, said, no, how do you know? This is the janitor. He goes, the ones that are bouncing inevitably get injured and have to leave the program. And the ones that stretch like they're supposed to stick. And they're all talented, so they end up going and doing something. So do not bounce, do not jump, do not anything. Uh, I came up with a quick program based on posture, muscles you could prioritize to stretch. Okay, That is, after a long program, you're feeling kind of tightened, you can adapt these stretches to loosen back up again. Okay, so I listed them there, and then go ahead and next slide. I actually printed them out. Okay, I got some pictures off the internet. A couple of quick words there. That's what's on your handout. Okay, so you don't have to. We don't have to talk about these. But go ahead and next slide. Scalings are these muscles in through here? Pec major and pec minor. You put a pecs, right? There's actually a pec major, which is this big one here. The more important one is the pec minor. It's a smaller muscle right here, and it actually is the one that pulls shoulder forward like this. Okay, if you're tight here and you have that roll looking shoulder, this is very common in women, particularly thin women, which adolescent females tend to be. You see them walking around and they're not only hunched, but they may be, but they're just this part right here is a little bit forward. That's a tight pec minor. Okay? Biceps, which is this muscle here. Next one. Uh, external rotators, that's your muscles that do this, so you're actually going to stretch this way. Next one. Supinator. So supinator is the muscle that does this. So obviously with your with your fingering hand, it's right, it's doing this. So you want to stretch uh, stretch that out by going the other way. Right? And then lastly your finger flexors. This is a fairly easy one. There's others, but okay. Next slide. That's it. Thank you. Anybody has something they'd like to know a little bit more about? About how much time, like per day, should they spend stretching with these certain things? Like five minutes? Ten? It, it depends. If you are seeking to stretch for more flexibility, as I mentioned, you should stretch after you've warmed up, preferably after you've exercised. And if it's the arms, you really don't need to stretch that much. It's 15 seconds uh, times two, and, and I might try to do that twice per day. For the legs, it's longer. 30 seconds of sustained stretching times two, twice a day. 
There isn't evidence that shows if you do more than that, that you actually get substantial benefit. That is, if you stretch for a minute each time, there's no, no, no real uh, proof that it actually is better. That being said, some very flexible people swear that I stretched an insane amount, like I held this position for like 10 minutes and, and whatnot, and you see all sorts of videos and whatnot. But the research does not seem to support that. Uh, so that's what I recommend. I have a question. So one of the things I, I find fascinating is human potential. For me, that is sort of the umbrella that all the work we do, you know, connects us. And um, so you mentioned Paganini, who had a condition which allowed his body to do extreme things. And yet there's a violinist, Sarah Chang, who recorded every single Paganini caprice when she was like 10. Which blows my mind because I couldn't, even as an adult, and I'm fairly large for my figure, I could never even open my hand in those ways. So, or someone like Midori, I know you were, you got to see her perform, who still in her 40s practices on average four to six hours a day. Are these anomalies or do they just know certain things that the rest of us don't? Is this a connection of spirit? Do you have any thoughts on? Examples like that? It's a big debate. I mean, uh, there's an interesting book out, uh, I think it's called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, yep. uh, and he presents a number of, and, there, and it's been debated, you know, data that shows, for example, that um, I believe he used hockey players from Canada and soccer players from Europe, uh, and uh, an astonishing percentage of professional soccer players in Europe, I think it's 85%-ish, are in the older half of their grade, okay? And so the notion is you're in sixth grade and you happen to be 12 and a half rather than 12. And you're out on that same soccer field and they're choosing sides. And if you have equal talent and you're six months older, you're a better player. So they pick you. And you get, oh, you're so good. Johnny's so good at soccer. Right? And eventually he gets encouraged to practice, 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 practice. And what do they say about musicians, right? Uh, the, he uses an example of, of a conservatory musicians the ones who go to conservatory, the ones that end up practicing that magic 10,000 hours. You've probably heard of that in sports recently. You know, Tiger Woods got 10,000 hours by the time he was 21, and that's why he's so amazing. And the same thing with the Williams sisters and, and whatnot, that that 10,000 hours of practice in any one thing seems to be a minimum criteria for a certain level of mastery, okay? And uh, so obviously the more you practice, the better it is. The difficulty with that is that it's hard to separate out what is inborn and what is not. I could practice 10,000 hours, and I can guarantee you I will never dunk a basketball. Okay? It's just not going to happen, right? And similarly, I think there's people out there. But I think for your talent level, if you can get that 10,000 hours, you will maximize your potential. But I think there's certainly people out there. Mozart is the, is the classic thing. This is in, in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books addressed this. He said, if you look at Mozart, one, his father was a renowned musician, okay? So the fact that you had five-year-old Mozart playing pretty high-level violin at the time, you're like, well, we know kids like that now, don't we? Okay? And uh, his compositions, how much of that was dad helped? You know, you see that essay at school that that kid did, and you're like, oh, man, either that kid's really smart or his professor dad did it for him, right? How do you tell? Okay? And in fact, if you look at Mozart's works, this author said, many musical experts claim, his early compositions weren't that good. Uh -huh. Okay? It wasn't until he hit the late 20s that his final works were considered brilliant. Okay? He hit that threshold. Now, so it's hard to judge. And so I would say that it's hard to judge. You know? But clearly to get that 10,000 hour mark, you have to have passion for it, right? You have to have uh, love for what you're doing. That's so, great. Yeah. I have a couple more questions. I don't want to dominate the questions. Um, what about things like naproxen, anti-inflammatories? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, naproxen, the current thinking, particularly for the young folks, is that we may have a lifetime maximum of being able to take drugs like naproxen, ibuprofen, Advil, uh, etc. Uh, before our kidneys start to, to die, okay? 
And uh, it's not liver for ibuprofen or, or naproxen, it's the kidney filtration gradually uh, fades uh, because you're basically dissolving your kidneys. Um, it's usually only if you take high doses regularly for long periods of time. So in my practice, if you're on a high dose, and this is usually like twice what you can get over the counter. Like if you're reading the bottle and you're doing twice what the bottle is telling you, one, shame on you, but two, that's prescription level dose. And so if someone does that regularly in my practice, I do a blood test on their kidneys uh, about every three or six months depending on their dose. Okay? The problem, and I have to tell them this, is that that blood test really starts to get abnormal when your kidneys are filtering 50% or lower than capacity. So, Because keep in mind, some people donate kidneys, right? So you only actually need one. So you're going to filter your blood fine until you drop below 50%, right? And so if it shows up on the blood test, that means your kidneys are working less than 50%, and it's really time to pay attention. Now, we don't know what that number is, the total milligrams that we can eat in our lifetime. One article I read suggested a million milligrams, but if you do the math, it's actually not that many over the lifetime, okay? It's also gonna vary from individual to individual. In some ways, people uh, have, uh, can run long distance and some people can't. Their kidneys can also endure more or less. No one tattooed the number on your forehead for the number of milligrams you're going to be able to eat. So the idea is, if you find that you are using ibuprofen or similar substances, regularly at high doses, then maybe it's time to seek alternative solutions. But if you're doing it once in a while, then I wouldn't be too concerned. I think it's actually a good thing. Uh -huh. Do your kidneys recover? Like if you've, if you've taken ibuprofen for a long time, high doses, and then you stop, are they able to sort of regenerate and recover, or they, then that takes out of the million that you're allowed? They can to some extent, but usually by the time we're seeing something, they're 50% deteriorated. And so just, and again, these are not numbers to quote, but it's like, imagine, okay, I stopped the ibuprofen, I may be able to get back from 50% to 60%. And then your blood tests are going to look great because you've gone past that threshold again. But it won't take much for it to drop back below 50% and for it to show up in your... Now, that being said, there are many people who live on 40, 30, 20, and then by the time they get down to 10%, they're on dialysis. Okay, so that, there's, there's still room, even when that blood test shows up. A general rule of thumb, too, is if you do take ibuprofen regularly for whatever reason, you want to take it less than a third of the days a month. So 10 days a month or less. Because there's other side effects like rebound headaches if you start taking it more often than that. Not everyone gets them, but it can be a problem. So if you're noticing, hey, I wake up in the morning with a headache. Well, it's because most of us take our ibuprofen during the day, go to sleep. You may recall that ibuprofen lasts about six hours, not the long acting stuff. And so you, when you wake up eight hours later, you've been two hours off the medicine and you have a headache because you're actually going through rebound. Okay? So. Oh, I'm just wondering if you could recommend a, like a simple stretch for neck or upper back or, you know. So uh, one of the ones uh, for this part is probably what you're referring to is you, is you can reach down to the, the arm, grab the seat of your chair with the split side you want. Okay? And that stabilizes your shoulder down. Because if you just stretch your neck like this and you're not grabbing on anything, then this happens. Right? Because muscles are like rubber bands. Okay? You need to stabilize it at the other end. And so you would do down here, and then you would go stretch that way. Now, the muscle here is long and flat. So you have to tilt to get different aspects of it. You can't just do this because you're only going to get one part of it. You have to tilt and then do another part. Another trick, if that is insufficient, is you try to lengthen the neck first before you tilt. So you get good posture and hold yourself as long as possible this way. And then as you're tilting, you still feel yourself go up and over. You're not just going down, you're going up and over when you stretch. And that should accentuate the stretch further. That's a, that's a frequently involved muscle. I just want to make sure my young um, artists here are hearing just what I'm hoping is the connection between hydration and overall health and how some of that could be impacting their muscles too. Right. More and more literature showing that your body needs all sorts of water to properly uh, metabolize your nutrition, your food, into energy, uh, to keep your tissues young and healthy. Uh, so yeah, staying well hydrated is very important. We're, we're discovering more and more how important it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really passionate about this, but I just... 
heard a little bit through some friends who are passionate about this as well, about using heat versus ice, and then there's sometimes the alternating methodology. Do you have any experience, or I know it might be it's a sensitive subject, but... You know, it, it's, to me, if you think about what the modalities do, mm -hmm. right, ice uh, clamps down your blood circulation, mm -hmm. right? It uh, numbs you up. Uh, so if you have a lot of swelling uh, and it hurts, ice is kind of good. Okay. Ultimately, though, what do you want if it's dam actually damaged in there? Right? If it's damaged in there, you want blood to get in there to bring healing cells in there to knit you back together, bring nutrients and, and get that going. But if it's already swollen, one, we're big bottles, we're big balloons of water, right? So if we're swollen, water has a harder time getting in. There's more pressure in our body or in that region of the body. So you actually want to get the swelling down first so that the blood can kind of flow through there. But ice will numb you up and, and help. But I, to me, eventually the heat needs to happen because that's going to encourage blood flow, right? That's going to incre increase the circulation and, and allow your body to do what it does. But it's that balance. And that's why I've said if it still hurts when you put heat on it, like when you first hurt, hurt it, at first start, ice is a good choice. But if you feel like, okay, it's starting to feel a little bit better, let's try heat, and then it makes it hurt again, then you probably switch too soon. That's sort of the rule of thumb. Well, let me give an applause for